Hey, good Wednesday morning. Michael Clark here with BAM Weather with your latest longer range forecast update. Hey, we're going to talk about uh, temperatures today, how we're going to get hot, another heat wave coming, but also the risk for thunderstorm clusters. And what does it look like as we get uh, late July into August? Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, share it with a friend if, uh, if this is of any value to you. Uh, we appreciate the shares. Uh, for sure. Let's get into the, the analysis today. Look at this. This is the low temperature rank uh, yesterday uh, by Climate District in terms of the warmth. So it was basically the warmest night ever in Ohio, right, uh, for low temps. It was the second warmest night ever for low temps in portions of Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Michigan. We've had warm overnight lows yesterday. Check this out. This is the season to date. Uh, so essentially what this is telling us is, is that um, it's a, in, in this general vicinity, probably um, a, a, about right here in terms of, of the growing regions, uh, we're running about, you know, fifth or so-ish uh, warmest. Uh, portions of Indiana and Ohio are, are running some of the warmest it's ever been for nighttime low temperatures. Why am I bringing this up? Because uh, that's not good for the U.S. grain. It's not good for the corn crop. All right, it doesn't. Yeah, when the, when the nighttime lows do not get below 70 degrees, the crop struggles to to rest and recoup. It stays kind of tense. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that here later in the video because I do believe that it's relevant. It has been warm at night. Okay. Um, taking a look here today, the severe weather outlook for today: a chance of stronger thunderstorms across Wisconsin. Uh, Michigan, Northern Illinois, that, that uh, kind of all skirts off to the east here tomorrow as we have a marginal risk for some stronger storms along the front. And then it calms down day three before it picks back up this weekend for sure. Um, a look at radar right now it does show a, a, a variety, right, of uh, rain and thunderstorms out and about um, across the area in the northern plains, um, Iowa, Minnesota, and then over here across portions of Indiana. And then we're watching a tropical disturbance down to the south, which I'll talk more about that here in just a minute, all right? Um, but let, let's take a look at a couple of things. This is the soil moisture percentile index. It's, this is updated. This is our latest. And uh, this is kind of where things are, uh, the top four to six inches of soil. This is using the NASA Sportless Index data. Um, it's and, and, and it helps us kind of understand where folks need precipitation, where, where there's moisture that's needed. Um, and there, there are places that need moisture. In fact, you know, places that have not seen adequate moisture in a widespread fashion in the last couple of weeks continue to run here. But we also continue to see spots in eastern Nebraska, northern Kansas, and portions of northern uh, Missouri. So there's a couple of places, believe it or not, that actually need some rain. Okay, um, In terms of excess where, where rain's been too much, we go to the seven-day observed rainfall totals, and you can see portions of eastern Nebraska, central Iowa, western, northwestern Illinois, where it's really been pretty excessive in terms of rain. Uh, but, you know, take a look at this. Again, there, there are spots that have not had the rain that, you know, that really we need this time of year. And it's weird. This pattern has been so strange uh, because... It's so sporadic. It's so hit and miss. And, and, and you know, it's, it's very difficult uh, to, to model and to forecast uh, patterns like this because you, you, you have these haves and have not situations. Okay. You've got a, you've got a section in here. You know, you, you, you have these spots that um, because Iowa and northwestern Illinois have gotten rain, everybody thinks that everything's perfect. Maybe it is, but when you look at who needs the rain, you can see where it certainly uh, shows up and it's needed, right? Um, just the next 24 hours, real quick, we'll talk about where rain is forecast. It's scattered in nature. These aren't widespread rains, but the areas I just talked about could receive some scattered thunderstorm risks, which certain, certain farms, certain locations would get them, right? Here's the percent of normal rainfall the last two weeks, and this may help just kind of, again, understand who needs the rain and where uh, as it pertains to normal, as, as it relates to, you know, what's normal? Well, that's a good question. I don't even know what's normal. Uh, no, just kidding. So this is a look here at Michigan. 
uh, again, Illinois. And again, you can kind of see where the spot is as it pertains to what normally falls um, in this time of year, right? Um, you, you're lacking. There, are, now there are places in here that are not lacking as, as well, but you can kind of see the general takeaway there. And then again, in the Dakotas and portions of Minnesota, the last two weeks, they're just they've just needed rain. It, it's not that it hasn't rained, um, but you understand what I'm saying. It's not picture perfect. And in the areas where it, we do need rain, uh, it's been warm and, and, and primarily focusing on two even more so is the excessive nighttime low temperatures that have been present, especially in the eastern grain belt, the Ohio Valley. Uh, but it's been very warm in the eastern grain belt and especially up here into the north and east where temperatures over the last two weeks have ran, you know, about five degrees above the normal. So Again, just trying to give you a, a, a you know, a, a breakdown of where things are. You know, you call it, call it for what it is. We are watching again tropical disturbance in Vest 93. 40% chance of tropical cyclone formation. I don't think it becomes a tropical cyclone, but I think it could bring some heavy rain here. Day two, day three into Louisiana, which is really about it. There's the, the seven day rainfall forecast down there in New Orleans. Yeah, you may get some locally heavy amounts there along the coast, upwards four or five inches, right? But uh, nonetheless, let's talk about the pattern here at home, okay? Because it's a busy one, and it's uh, it's an interesting one. And I want to start, uh, I'm going to come up like this so I can maybe get that. Uh, yeah, I want to start with kind of what, what the, the, the idea with the pattern here and the flow pattern is. Um, I'm going to turn this on so you guys can see... Uh, uh, possibly the uh, the time time stamps here show the time box there we go go back to drawing and uh, these are all eastern time uh, eastern time zone uh, times right but what what starts to happen this this uh, weekend is a ridge develops down to the south instability goes up precipitable water values moisture content goes up um, and and so you can kind of see What's happening is pieces of energy, watch here, I want you to watch, you know, kind of here over the course of, of, of the forecast period, pieces of energy are going to start flowing around the periphery of the ridge. Here's the, the core of the ridge would be down here, right? And so uh, we watch as we go forward here. Okay, this is uh, getting into Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening. And again, I want you to note the, the kind of the gradient there, the instability and the precipitable water values, and then the disturbance. This is all a classic setup for what we would call a big MCS, big thunderstorm cluster, that could bring strong storms to the area, okay? Something to think about. That's wave number one Saturday. And then there's another one possibly again on Sunday. Look at the, the water values. They rise up, the purples. The Cape builds Sunday afternoon. Extreme gradient there uh, for instability. And then there's the disturbance right there. There's the gradient, and there's the moisture. Uh, again, another round. So the areas that have been dry across Illinois, Indiana, Michigan certainly have the potential to get thunderstorms this weekend, uh, potentially significant ones. All right, so while we will get rain, some of it could be heavy. You're also going to be dealing with the potential for some stronger thunderstorms both Saturday and Sunday uh, with this type of weather pattern, okay? Uh, and again, you can kind of see this continues. Now the ridge strengthens. It'll start pushing some of this stuff further north here as you get into Monday. Uh, but nonetheless, you see the, the extreme instability in the middle, the high water content, high values in the, in the pieces of energy that want to go up and over the top. So when you look at this as a whole for seven day rain numbers, um, again, you can see, you can see what it's doing there. Uh, come down here a little bit. There you go. You can see what the, the, the pattern, the path it's, this is trying to, to, to depict is this northwest flow. It's that, that flow pattern from the north and west is, gonna, is going to, um, you know, encourage MCS development um, and stalled out boundaries and, you know, isolated pop-ups be put down big, heavy rain events. But again, you know, listen, yeah, it, Two and a half inch rainfall forecast the next seven days where it hasn't rained in eastern Illinois in a couple of weeks. This is a big deal for those folks. In north central Indiana, it's a big deal. Uh, these folks need the rain over the next seven days. So that's the, the idea here. You go further up to the north and west. Again, uh, not 
plentiful rains, but not a bone dry forecast either. Some of the Canadian prairies, they may get half inch, three quarters of an inch rain. Okay. So going forward, let's take a look at this pattern and what it's projected to do. Th this is the, the, the cool shot here we've been talking about. It does, it does squash temperatures, but the ridge really starts to take hold and take shape here Saturday into Sunday. And these really warm temperature departures will really start to take shape here early next week. Okay. Uh, you can see just where the core of the warmth is. And, and, and by later next week, day seven to eight, which is Thursday, Friday of next week, these are significant departures from normal for temperatures. Very, very warm. Uh, so significant heat wave coming. Okay. And one potentially too that, um, you know, this apparent temperature is going to be soaring. Um, the, the feels like, you know, we'll go to the Ohio Valley, feels like temp. You can see it's it's getting up there next week. I mean, it's this is warm stuff. You know, 105, well into Illinois, Indiana. That's uh, that's Wednesday. There's Thursday. All right. Uh, there's Friday, Saturday. And you look, you got you got mid to upper 90s here. You know, everybody says, well, you know, it gets hot in the summer. I, I get it. It, no, it normally doesn't feel like 105 around here. That's not normal. Okay. And getting the actual air temperature uh, to to be that warm as well is is yeah you know, it's a problem for the crop you know this you're not you're not really growing a much 95 degrees in some spots all right so again just don't want it to seem as if it's it's you know just sunshine and rainbows i'm not saying it's horrible i'm also not saying it's perfect um it's something it's stuff that needs to be considered here but this is the idea you see this, this, these darker reds, this heat ridge. Watch out! Watch to the end of the month here. I mean, it, it. This is a substantial signal, okay? Especially for the eastern grain belt in the south. This is a significant signal for heat, a lack of rain, and potentially tropical signals too. But if a pattern like this materializes late July, what you're going to do is, is quite frankly, you're. For the most part, you're going to shut off moisture in here, and you're going to push moisture up into the central plains and the northern plains you know, along the southwest flow aloft, much like what we've seen there early June where we had that heat. Okay. Um, so, you know, again, th that's something to keep in mind is, is, is that uh, if this pattern emerges and comes back, uh, that's what it would do to the precipitation. And you can kind of you, you can kind of see... We'll go to the 15-day anomaly, but you can see where we are right now, okay? Th this, is, this is the next 15 days, but this is going to be largely because of the northwest flow over the next week. We'll go to the European Ensemble real quick, and we'll just uh, show the, the five-day uh, departures. There's the one to five. We'll go here to the, to the latest run. There's the one to five. The six, again, you can see the northwest flow is so prevalent there. But again, you can see what starts to happen in the extended forecast is that it would get drier and push moisture back further into the plains. That would be the risk if that ridge returns that in the way that it possibly could. Okay, that's through the end of July. Hot, I think, really is the story. But I want you to keep an eye on this right here. Okay, this is coming in here into the Bering Sea uh, around the 19th. I think the first week of August... Uh, we're going to take this trough uh, and possibly a big cold front and, and move a front through here. Uh, look for a big trough and a cool down the first week of August to move through the area before more warmth returns, we believe. All right, but let's look for a big front the first week of August. We're looking at years that, that really correlate strongly to the pattern. Right now, 2010 is a big leading uh, analog year. And we look at years for, for the August outcome. We're looking at the Atlantic Ocean. We're looking at the global wind patterns. And again, what you can see here, um, you know, is, is the potential for um, the warmth to, to dominate in August more so than what it was. Uh, but also the dryness to possibly persist in areas that have had some, some lack of rain. Not that it hasn't rained, and it will rain in this area later this week. But August suggests some ridging. Uh, really, what, what August is saying here in these analog years, uh, if you draw this out, is somewhat of a, of a sprawled out area of high pressure, which is really what the, the extended range data is showing, by the way. 
Um, and, and what happens is this precipitation shows up around, around this more so than it does in the middle of it. All right. And then you get your temperatures to be above normal. Okay. So August precip pattern may be a lot like July's overall. Uh, temperatures, I think the core of the warmth is focused in the eastern grain belt in the deep south, cooler to the north and west. But what do the yields say for years like this? Well, if you look at it, you have at or above trend yields in three of the years. You've got 05, you've got 17, and you've got 21. Okay, but in 2010, 2011, 19, all right, and uh, uh, 24, four out of the seven are an above or a below trend yield. Three are above. Looking at everything, all things considered, you know, d considering all this data, looking at that trend chart, the analog years, I, I think it's setting up shop for it to be right at a trend yield, which again, interestingly enough, would make it the largest crop we've ever had. I don't think that's off the table. It's more likely it would be below trend than I than above, in my opinion, right now. I don't I don't think it could be above the trend uh line yield. But if it does hit trend, it is the largest crop we've ever had. It's very interesting. From a weather perspective, that's my take on that right now. Um and we'll continue to monitor this going forward. But it isn't picture perfect to be talking about 185 yields here I, I just don't believe that but it's also not horrible and uh, it's not the worst I've seen for growing conditions from a weather perspective so take it or leave it I don't care uh, guys share this with a friend subscribe to the YouTube channel if the video brought you any value today thanks for watching we'll talk to you soon